welcome to For the Love of Nature, a podcast where we tell you everything you need to know about nature and probably more than you wanted to know. I'm Laura fox LaPole. And I'm Katie Holloway. And it's National Pollinator Week this week. Woo-woo. That's pretty exciting. So uh, we're going to be talking about today is animal pollination that is done by any animals other than bees and butterflies. Because those... Yeah, because those are so th- yeah. regular. I don't want to say overdone because they're both very important. But <laughs> basic, they're basic. Yes, they're just basic. It, it, you know, <laughs> and, and we have talked about both of those before in other episodes. Yeah, you're right. So we're totally. we're gonna explore a little bit of uh, other pollinators since it is National Pollinator Week. Yeah, and speaking of, uh, just real quick to lay some groundwork, what is a pollinator? So according to the National Park Service, a pollinator is anything that helps carry pollen from the male part of a flower to the female part of the same or another flower. Basically, it takes pollen from one flower to another, usually, um, and that helps in sexual reproduction of plants. Plant babies. Yeah. In a nutshell. Very important. Mo- very important for most plants. Yes. And what's also really fun is next week, we're going to have our first official guest on the show with us. Super exciting. Yeah. So I don't, I mean, Kim was a guest. Yes. Yeah. 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 But she's also part of the show. So she was kind of like our test run of um, doing three audios. We've figured out <laughs> something else that'll help hopefully make our lives a lot easier on the editing end of things. So we're going to give that a try, but yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but make sure you uh, listen in next week. Cause we're going to be having um, a biologist on uh, and interviewing the biologist and she's going to be telling us about her job. Um, and it does deal with pollinators. So this episode is sort of like a sneak peek for next week and our first guest that we're going to have. Yeah, to wet your whistle about pollination. <laughs> to wet your pollinator whistle. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, what uh, what uh, news do you got for us? Well, I think everybody, and I'm going to say this, and I hope you've at least heard of it, but I, I think everybody has heard about the Cape Cod diver that was eaten by a whale. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. So... If anybody has been living in a, under a rock or in the belly of a whale, there was a <laughs> there was a a Cape Cod diver, and his name was Bob Peck, and he, he's a lobster diver. Right? He is a lobster diver, and he he runs the Bob Peck of Adventure Diving Services. Or, so his company is Adventure Diving Services, and that was quite the adventure. So he is a, a diver for for pretty much 50 years, and he was just out diving, and suddenly everything went black, and then he could f- feel like it shoot up, and the whale went to the surface, basically spit him out, and those on his boat were able to, like, find him, and then they, so they witness it, find him, help yeah, him. Yeah, thankfully, because if there wasn't witnesses, right. No one would ever. Believe. Nobody would. Nobody because would. It's like a one in a trillion chance. That yes. You're and so they saw it happen, or they saw like the whale come up, spit him out. They got him onto the boat. They took him to the hospital. The doctors did not believe him because there's like yeah. there's absolutely no way. Um, but thankfully, a lot of divers and fishermen are coming to back this guy's story to be like, no, it's totally possible. Uh, it, it, like, it's something that does really bad. Timing. Yeah. Just really bad timing. Um, and possibly like maybe his boat was a little too close to a feeding pot of water. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, yeah. But. So, yeah. So they, it, I mean, the guy was okay. I mean, we'll start that off. He is yeah. seen. Oh wait, did I say his name? His name was yeah. Bob Beck, but then later on it says, oh no, no, no. So they interviewed Bob Peck. The guy's name is Michael. Is that the guy who, like, rescued him? I think so. So the actual okay. guy's name is Michael Packard. Sorry, okay. Mr. Packard. Um, but, yeah. Or Bob. Yeah, we, we, we would, you know, we didn't want to hurt your business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very true. Yes, please go to Adventure Diving or whatever it was called. <laughs> Serious. So, um, so yeah, so Michael, Michael Packard is the guy that it actually happened to. Um, I remember them, he, I remember in the article it was saying something like he thought, first of all, he thought his legs were broken. Yeah, he thought he was like, I think, I, I read one that he thought that he was like bit by a shark or something and just like 
blacked out um, yeah. or whatever. And nope, you were just eaten by a whale. It's it's fine. I just also, can you even imagine the poor whale? Because, like, you're just a giant, you know, I think it was like a humpback. Yeah, it's, it was a humpback. Just filter feeding, doing a big old swallow, and all of a sudden, you know, it'd be like drinking lemonade and getting a fly in. Right. And you'd be like, oh, oh yeah. Like, just <laughs> put it out. <laughs> Except for it's a human. Like, right. you spit but it out. Whale, yeah. yeah, it's a human. Poor whale. I wish... Like, that would be totally something that would be, like, amazing to happen to you for the stories alone. Right. But no one would ever believe you, especially if you didn't have scars. Right, yeah. Like. <laughs> I was swallowed by a whale. Where are you? Where are your scars? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Because uh, you're like, it had baleen. Sorry. Yeah. Like, it wasn't a killer whale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> So anyway, he right. he's fine. Mr. Packard, he's fine. Recovering well. He's been on, like, several inter- interviews and stuff. Um, it's a crazy story. Also, I find it very interesting. I mean, I guess it's a it's a whale, but in the spit, I guess he would have to be at the surface. But you would think, yeah. like, just open your mouth. Right, in and the like, push with your tongue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I see, like, like, our turtle does that, the snapping turtle. Like, if she gets a rock in her mouth, she just spits it out underwater. Yeah, so it's weird that it wouldn't do that. I the I heard that the guy who rescued him saw it like shake like it got him out by like shaking its head and like flung him into the air. Yeah, that's what, that's what out. I saw that too. So I wonder if it was like it, they don't have I don't know like the tongue dexterity. <laughs> I was about to say that same term. <laughs> like, but then how did I mean it had to have a little bit to keep him from going down its throat. Yeah, I don't know. Or was like, or was it just, or was I mean having a human. I mean humpback whales are huge. But yeah. they're they're designed to eat fish, you know or, what I mean? Or even plankton. You know, yeah, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. So it's incredibly <laughs> tiny. So maybe it was like, like it physically could not swallow him. I can just picture it. You know, like every kid picturing this is picturing this guy like holding on to its uvula. <laughs> <just like, laughs> I th- I thought you were gonna say um, whenever he spit it out. You know those videos of the great white sharks that yes. fling uh, sea lions or the great or or the killer whales. Yeah, yeah, how they fling seals and sea lions into the air, and it's like <laughs> it's so like twenty it's so high feet. <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's so morbid. morbid. Yeah, just <laughs> woo, and away they go. <laughs> Uh, I mean, sharks gotta eat. Whales gotta yeah. eat. Just not humans, hopefully. Right. <laughs> right. Ideally. All right. What's your What's your okay. nature news? Um. Well, Facebook knows that I like nature news, so it just shows up on my feed always. But it's usually dinosaurs. So here we go. Our <laughs> dinosaur one. Your it's algorithm just is just dinosaurs now. Yeah. 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 Um. So this article it. It's got a long title, but it says, This pterosaur supported its giant neck with bones built like bicycle wheels. Interesting. Um, This is, okay, so there is something, like, terrifying about, like, pterosaurs, like, flying dinosaurs. And, like, bird dinosaurs. I don't know what it is. It's, like, it's just creepy. Especially the way they they move. Um, I mean, it's it's almost so, like my thing of I don't trust birds that can stand yeah. and stare me eye to eye. You don't know what it is, yeah. but it's just there's just something unnatural about it. And I mean, and this is as close to like this is a reptile yes. that flies. So this is as close to a dragon as you're pretty get. pretty much <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, these were the ones that are the size of giraffes, which is um, insane. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's so scary. <laughs> yeah. So imagine a giraffe pterosaur, or for the, you know, pterodactyl, if you're picturing, like, a specific thing, but a pterosaur is just the group. Um, So it had, it was the size of a dinosaur, uh, of a giraffe, like I said, and it was... Like the wingspan or the body was? uh, Did it say? Well, it says the wingspan is eight meters. Okay. So so huge. Yeah. The neck is 1.5 meters. Oh my gosh. super long, like, snake-like, yeah. like, giraffe-like neck. And they think that they lived on, um, they preyed on fish, small mammals, and even baby dinosaurs. Huh. So it's called the, Aj- I believe you pronounce it Ashdarkid pterosaur, um, from Morocco. Well, from modern-day Morocco. And, uh, they, they found, you know, they found this skeleton. It's got this insanely long neck, which is a super impractical yeah. for something that flies. <laughs> I just, um, that's how they, went, that's how they died. Just necks kept snapping. Like, right, because, right, if, and, and how could you support 
large prey with a neck that long while you're in the air. I just picture like a noodle neck, like, like it can't hold its head up ever. So apparently they did scans of its bones and they found that, you know, like modern birds, to be able to fly, this dinosaur had to have some pretty hollow bones. Yes. But also like modern birds, it's got some stability inside. Well, this one had all of these little, like, spikes throughout the bone, huh. um, and they called them, um, trabeculae. So trabeculae were arranged a little bit like a bicycle spokes, but in the, specifically in the shape of a helix throughout it, <laughs> and they did some, like, tests to see if it gave it extra sturdiness, and just having some, like, doubled the strength of what it could do. Interesting. And it actually had, like, a hollow tube down the middle for its spinal cord. So, like, its stuff was in the bone. So I wonder what happened... Like, I wonder what happened that that trait left. You know what I mean? Like, Uh, from an evolution perspective, that's smart. It allowed them to carry larger prey. They think up to the side... From what they tested, at least something as heavy as a turkey... That which is pretty um, heavy. I mean, for something that flies. Yeah, it's a yeah, turkey. It's <laughs> so some, and it would also help apparently with the strong winds that would be buffeting its head. Its <laughs> neck had to be strong so its neck didn't snap in the high winds. Yeah. Guess that's, I'm just, I'm still just imagining like a dinosaur with a, like a noodle neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then also apparently the males would like beat each other with their heads. Of course, of course. So they had strong <laughs> necks. <laughs> Because I feel so, like that's what a male of any species does. <laughs> just beat each other, just beat each other up. I think now the now the um the the next question is, is this unique to this species, which they don't know. And the problem is that it's very rare to find fossilized dinosaur bones that retain their 3D structure. Yeah. Yeah. So Ha. Huh, I but I, pretty cool for now. I guess no modern day anything has a structure like that. Yeah, so th- I guess not exactly. Yeah, I know that I know bird bones have some. Yeah, some, but why did spokes? Yeah, but it's it's more sporadic. It's not like right. It's and not patterned. It actually, surround correct. Like your, their little nerves don't go through the bone. That seems impractical because if your bone breaks, you're just dead. dead. Yeah, but I don't know. Uh, interesting. Our, anyway, yeah, pollination. Pollination. All right, are you ready for my very first other than bees and butterflies pollinator? I was just going to tell people really quick that, so we went over what a pollinator is, um, but we're going to talk about animal pollination. Yes. um, Which pollination happens lots of different ways, but specifically we're going to be talking about animals that do it. Yes. And that they pollinate a lot of different species of plants, which we'll talk about. I'm not going to lie. You said animals that do it, and I took a hot split second to be like, are both of mine animals? Like, <laughs> like to think, they are. I hope so. <laughs> Other- <laughs> uh, it's been a long, long week already. Alrighty. <laughs> All right, go for Ready? it. Ready? All right, so my first one is bats. Um, yes, so, so I, cool. I absolutely love bats, and I, I'm always really excited to talk about them. Not many people think of bats when you think of a pollinator, but yeah. let me tell you, they are not only super important pollinators, but also super cute pollinators. I think that I know, they are adorable. I think they're so cute. Especially, like, bats are so cool because they are so specialized. They are. So many things. Yes. Very interesting. Which is pretty amazing. If you don't think bats are cool, um, just fight listen. Us. Yeah, and then fight us <laughs> if you don't believe we should, it. We'll eventually do a bat episode too, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do. I love bats. All right, so let's go over some basic facts about bats first. Uh, there are over 1,400 bats worldwide and can be found everywhere except for extreme deserts and polar regions. They range in size from the smallest bat, the kitty hognose bat, which oh. <laughs> which weighs less than a penny, to the iconic flying fox, which has a wingspan of up to six feet. Dang, man. Which is I one of see one, do, but it'd also be terrifying. No, no, it, because they look like puppies. Because I've seen the, the Australian... That's true. I, their faces are really cute. I, I saw them in Australia. Like, yes, they're huge, but they don't seem... Like, yes, it's six feet across, but it doesn't seem... Because their bodies are so small. You know what I mean? And they... 
they look like little tiny puppies. So they're s- super adorable. Um, so ba- foxes, if you will. Yeah, no, r- <laughs> flying, yeah, flying foxes, fruit bats. Um, so bats are promiscuous. Oftentimes a male or two were acquire a harem of females, harem of females, and they'll just mate away. Like just, just super excited. Uh, while most people think of bats, you know, bats as a whole, as a bloodthirsty, hair tangling, little heathens, there are only three species which drink blood, and very, very rarely do bats ever fly into someone's hair. And if they, oh yeah, it'd know, be an accident. Exactly, it's they don't want to be there any more than you want them there, so <laughs> they just they won't. Uh, so bats are the only true flying mammals. While there yeah. are many mammal species that can glide, like squirrels. Bats are only the only ones capable of actual like wing flapping flight. Yeah, yeah, they're the only ones that figured it out. So, and so, well, speaking of wings, I think a lot of people because I know I kind of had this image too. A lot of people, I think, when they visualize bat wings, they're thinking of it all wrong. How it's like structured. So, in comparison, like let's like say if, if we suddenly grew wings that were sort of like bats, I feel like most people believe that the bat wings drape from the bottom of their arms right like a cape like a vampire yes cape. but that's yeah. not what it is so they have ex- extremely long fingers and two thin layers of string or skin of string of skin <laughs> so two thin layers of skin which is stretched between the fingers below the arm so it's almost like if you had a really long like pinky ring finger kind of your middle finger and spread them all out, and they just hunt, your long, creepy pinky fingers dangled yeah. by your sides, and then it just went from like the sides of your bodies out to those pinky fingers, and then up to your hands, like draping under your arms. But you have long fingers that offer that stability. Yeah, you know. All right, so I and I have seen like, and so it has those two very, very, very thin layers of skin, and I've seen like post barbed wire injured bats and it is so heartbreaking um depending on the extent of the injuries bats may or may not recover from it however like most wild animals i think people would be surprised at the extent like of an injury that a bat can recover from um and they they heal super fast so it it is really interesting um so that's just a little bit about bats in general if anyone wants to talk more about bats or has bat questions i'm here for it just message me on it. We're going to Discord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we should talk about that at the end of the episode, too. Um, yeah. That we're going to start, well, or now, we're going to start posting the <laughs> Discord link. So we started a Nature Nerd Nation. Um, yes, and join the NNN. <laughs> So first of all, we didn't we do not think about this thoroughly because first we have like our social handles handles which is like footlawn and then we make up an yeah. acronym and it's like what is it like nation nature nerd nation so if you head over to our social media you can get the link there or message us and we'll message it to you but it's a place that we're just going to, you can talk to like-minded people about weird animal facts. You can talk to me about bats there. Please come join the Nature Nerd Nation so we can yes. talk to you because we are so excited for it. Um, so yeah, I will take any time to talk to you about bats, day or night most likely. Or only at night should yeah, I talk. That's when you should only talk about <laughs> yeah. bats. Except for flying foxes, fruit bats. I'll talk about them during the day. Correct. <laughs> Which are the ones that are mostly going to be who you're talking about, right? Is the fruit eating bats that do the pollination? Um, actually, not really. I, I will talk about them, but not really. All right. So, bat pollination then. In a lot of tropical and desert climates, plants heavily rely on bats. Bats are incredibly important pollinators, responsible for being the sole pollinator for over 300 different fruits. Which, okay, that's respectable. Yeah, that they are the only reason why those plants yeah. are alive. One of which is the agave plant and saguaro, which also solely rely on bats. And what's so important about agave? Tequila. Um, so, <laughs> so if we didn't have bats, there would not be tequila. 
let that sink in for a minute. If there's children listening, listen to this episode in about 10 years and you will love bats even more. Um, so what else wouldn't we have without bats? Mangoes, bananas, durians, peaches, cashews, and cacao. Okay, that's, okay, it's interesting because those are not solely bats. Because I have ones that also do pollinate do which mango ones and cacao. Okay, my source was wrong. I found us on multiple sources. I, yeah, Interesting. I on, I well, I do know minute. that over three hundred was accurate. That said, oh, it, it sure was it solely. Is. And these ones were the exam. Oh, some of the examples for it. So yeah, I, it would ma- it would make sense that more than one would pollinate. But I do know the agave is. Is that would be bats. Surprise yeah, because it's because yeah. it's desert. Like, what else is going to be out there to pollinate right. it? Because even bees don't really go out in the that kind of territory. Yeah, yeah, just like the insanity of it. So anyway, so maybe minus cacao and mangoes, you said. Yeah. Um, the other ones will give bats credit for. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so nothing else will do other than those 300, which is really impressive. Um, bats don't just eat insects and most traditional pollinators will call them. Um, th- so bats will visit the flowers at night, of course, cause they're bats. Um, they'll drink the nectar out, you know, just like bees, just like the bees, they'll have the pollen attached to their fur. And as they continue to go around from flower to flower, drinking the nectar, they just pollinate everything. Very similar to bees do. Um, However, though, they are just looking for very particular flowers, which need to be one to three and a half inches in size, Mm -hmm. white or pale in color, which I'm assuming is because it's brighter at night. Um, I think so. It needs to be bell-shaped just because of how they're how the bats are, um, and how, uh, how evolution has just figured it out. Like we want yeah, bats yeah. to pollinate us. What flowers. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's just like the same thing with Darwin's finches and beaks and yeah. nuts versus seeds and all that stuff. Um, and the other one are, is that these flowers are typically very fragrant, fragrant that smell like rotting fruit or musty, which is a horrible smell. Um, yeah. I used to take care of fruit bats at the zoo, and oh, it is a it, was it a is smelly, a smell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it a is smelly little bat house. Such a smell. Um, some bats they do travel great distances, spreading the flower pollen. Um, two species of nectar feeding plant bats, in particular, the lesser long nosed bat and the Mexican long tongue bat, migrate north a thousand miles or more every spring from Mexico to Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And both of these bats are listed as federally endangered, by the way. Um, so they are really important. And because I live in Texas and we have so many like huge bat caves. I've already gone down to Austin to see all the bats come out underneath bridge. the bridge, like the Congress Bridge. But then there's like another huge um, cave that they come out. And I really want to take a cool. trip to see there. Yeah, pretty cool. All right. So how do bats find the flowers on such a long trip that you might be asking? Um, so I'd like to point out here too, that not all bats use echolocation. However, the ones that pollinate flowers do use echolocation and that is how they find the flowers. Some species of flowering plants have evolved acoustic features. This is also why, this is also why it's the bell shape, um, which makes the bats echolocation voice more visible, if you will, to a bat. So if you can imagine like flying through a thick lush rainforest, I mean to the bat, he's just like screaming out, just yeah. trying to find a flower. Um I mean I wouldn't be able to find That's so cute to picture. Right? Just flower. Yeah. Flower. Just yeah. waiting for a response. Just and then you finally get one. And that's part of the reason why it's bell shaped. Besides it's because it has more, to, the bell shape has more to do it than just like the echo back, like the right. echo back to it. Because it has to do, I mean, same thing like we talked about, the, the shape of the bat's face and everything. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so plants have evolved to not only use the shape that makes it easy for bats to find them, but also the smell. Um, and so most plants that have both of these features only rely on bats to be their pollinators, hence why they evolve such features. 
So I mentioned early earlier about the quote unquote traditional pollinators. Um, well, bats help plants in other ways too, which is lower what you were talking about earlier. Fruit bats, for instance, eat the fruit and then disperse the seeds in their feces, which then can grow plants. Not to mention their poo, which is called guano, is an incredible is an incredible fertilizer. Oh yeah, that's S- definitely like a huge market for. Yeah. Oh yeah, guano. Heck yes. Yeah. So, but basically, they eat a seed, poop it out, it lands in the perfect fertilizer. So they're like a plant making machine. Right. That's growing their own food, really. Yeah. Like farmers. Yeah. Just pooping it out. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> just flying around eating this is stuff. It's a long time commitment. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, I mean, to be fair though, that is a way more effective gardener than I am for sure. Oh yeah. Like just going around. All right. So not only um, does this happen, but bats. Uh, that pollinate flowers, they also, they'll still eat insects too, um, more than 600 insects a night that those insects would normally typically eat the crops itself. Um, so they don't, not all bats eat insects, but a lot of them still do, obviously. Um, and so a lot of the traditional quote unquote pollinators, they can also eat insects. And so it's like a a double duty for them. So in conclusion, super cool. Yeah, no, it is. It is really neat, especially the echolocation thing in the bell. Yeah, I like I thought of that. Yeah, I would have thought they relied on the smell. Yeah, oh, yeah, and only the smell, but nope. Yeah, totally the sound too, which is cool. So, in conclusion, bats are not just creepy animals that are portrayed in the old scary movies. They're incredibly vital to our environment. They're freaking cute because they look like upside down <laughs> puppies, and in my opinion, the coolest pollinator other than bees and butterflies. Um, also I want to note here, if anyone ever wants to get me things with bats on them, not like the fake movie kind, yeah, but the yeah, real yeah. looking bats, I'm 100% game. <laughs> Listeners. No. Yeah. <laughs> I love, yeah. Okay. Um, well mine, that, it's a pretty good transition to mine because mine is also like a, um, a super unloved creature. Uh, probably way more so than bats. <laughs> um, cause I'm going to talk about flies. Uh, as pollinators. And, you know, uh, there are very few people out there that love flies. <laughs> I think that's one of the most targeted insects. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Because <laughs> they're everywhere and people yeah. want them gone. Yeah. Well, let me tell you how important flies are as pollinators because they are the second most effective pollinator. Um, hmm, above, interesting. Trailing, be- trailing behind bees. So the two species that I'm going to highlight of flies, you know, there's a tons of different species of flies. I'm not going to go into what flies are, but the two big species that do most of the pollination are hoverflies and blowflies. Hmm. Okay. So hoverflies, you've actually, I'm sure, seen them outside, and I just always thought they were bees because many of them are bee mimics. Um, Which is smart. Yeah, they have little stripes and everything, though if you look at them closely, you can see that something's they, not right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's and it's usually it's the eyes. They look like fly eyes and they have um only one pair of wings compared to bees which have two. And they're called hoverflies? Yeah. I'm going to look yeah. it up. They're really cute. They're really tiny. Like they look like teeny oh, tiny. Oh. Like a sweat Yeah, bee. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what I was just going to say. It almost looks like a sweat bee. Yeah, I'm yeah. definitely. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um so these are the two most prevalent species that pollinate things. Uh, so, just like bats have certain, um, flowers that they're attracted to, so does every other pollinator. That, the, the relationship between flowers and what they are pollinated by is extremely, um, like, specific. It's definitely, like, co like, they have co-evolved with each other. Together, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because flowers want to be pollinated because they mm-hmm. want sexual reproduction to happen. Yeah, because they so haven't evolved. They as haven't ev- as possible, and they haven't. Plants haven't. I mean, we're, we might get there one day, but plants haven't. Thank God, um, gone like full. Uh, what is it called in Lord of the Rings where they just the trees that just walk around oh, everywhere? Yeah, the ants. Yeah, they had just haven't gone full ent yet <laughs> to just <laughs> walk around and pollinate themselves. themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, the flower, the flowers that bees are, or uh, flies are attracted to are also pale, like bats, but sometimes they can also be, like, dull, dark purple or brown. Hmm. Um, they're usually flecked with translucent patches 
though that might not be able to be seen by the human eye. But in particular... Wait, wait, the flowers are translucent? Yeah, well, you, the flowers themselves, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> have, like, some weird translucent patches. I was looking at pictures of the hoverflies, and I saw a really cool one, and for a second I thought you were talking about the fly. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, the flower. Okay. No, that was on me. Okay, okay. The, the biggest giveaway that it's for flies is that it's got a putrid odor like rotting meat, dung, Ugh. um, sap, blood, something nasty. <laughs> um... <laughs> So it, cause it's, really I'm going to evolve and smell like blood. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and usually the flowers are funnel like or complex traps because, you know, flies are pretty small and they want the fly to get down in there and mess around. So an example <laughs> uh, <laughs> to get the pollen. <laughs> so some examples of flowers like this are skunk cabbage, which mm-hmm. any of you are yep. familiar, at least with the East coast of the United States, red Ugh. trillium, which you can okay. pick up. Jack in the Pulpit. Oh, that makes sense. Also a big one around here. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and cacao trees. So that's why I know this one, because thanks to midges, which are tiny flies, that's how we have chocolate. So cacao trees have extremely small flowers, um, that are downward facing, like really tiny flowers with like zero stem, um, that can only be pollinated by midges. So praise be to midges for chocolate. And maybe or not bats. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Remains to be seen. Um, so why are flies so beneficial? You know, I'm talking about what they're attracted to and all that stuff. Well, what's the big deal about them? Well, so flies, you know, a lot of us, I think, think about flies as being on dead stuff, which is true to a point. Yeah. But, okay, so some flies lay their eggs in rotting meat. Okay. That's, but not all flies do. Some actually lay their eggs in flowers and their larvas eat the flower once they've hatched. But all flies are going to drink nectar for energy and eat pollen for nutrients from flowers. Makes sense. I did not know. Yeah. Um, so they're covered in fine hairs that trap the pollen a lot like a bee. They, but what's better than bees is they can, they can roam around freely with a wider range because they don't need to stay near a nest. Like, bees don't have, like, a home base. I mean, flies don't have flies, a home base. Flies, yeah, flies don't. Um, and they're able to deal with much cooler temperatures and harsher weather and indoor growing conditions like a greenhouse that bees just aren't, aren't good at. Yeah, they just, yeah. They breed more quickly than bees and have a faster life cycle. Some even migrate, allowing them to outcompete bees in certain areas at certain times of year. Huh. And and then the bonus of them, kind of like how the bat is doing two jobs, mm-hmm. um, flies are too, because their larvae are often predaceous, and so they they eat pests that grow on that are on plants. Um, or their larvae are detrivores, which recycle the nutrients and turn things back into soil. So I'll end it on this really cool, um, there's some really cool studies being done because um, as many of you are probably aware, pollinators are in big trouble, which I'm sure we'll talk about more and with our guests next week. Um, but so we're looking at other options besides bees. So in a study done by Romina Radar, or Radar, an entomologist, they found that flies were the most important pollinator following bees. For some plants, they are the primary pollinator, not just an occasional visitor. Over 100 crop species are pollinated by flies, which are what we rely on to eat. Um, And more and more research is being done on fly pollination, how effective it is, and how it can be managed, like captive breed and release, which they're doing in greenhouses. And so an example of one of these studies is um, with mango tree pollination. So some mango farmers purposely hang barrels of roadkill from trees to encourage flies to come. They lay their eggs in the carcasses, but then they forage on the nectar and pollen, making them efficient pollinators. And so the study is being done to see, does the carcasses being there actually make a difference to how interesting the success rate? Yeah. But woof, can you imagine the smell? Yeah, that has to be horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Ugh. That's some dedication. Right? Jeez Louise. So although most of us are swatting at flies, and yes, they can be very annoying, they are very important. Second only to bees, more important than butterflies, pollinators. Very nice. So I did find the answer to the bat and cacao tree dilemma. Okay. 
So I talked about that they're the important pollinators for 300 fruits. Um, And... And yes, and what we wouldn't rely, like, what wouldn't we have without bats? So while your fly pollinates the flower itself, Uh so that helps to mate, that take, that just takes the pollen to the pollen, but I guess the, the cacao fruit itself does not fall naturally from the plant. Okay. So that's where the bats then come in eat it the fruit bats will come in eat the cacao and then it goes through poops it out and that's how they're able to reproduce because that cacao fruit will not will not naturally fall from the tree itself that is fascinating also why i mean right? i guess competition because it would be right at its own roots but come on like yeah that is yeah so, that's hedging your bets on bats right yeah <laughs> right so but i guess if you're already gonna rely on just midges yeah so i guess midges technically are the true pollinators right whereas then back the seed disperser yeah it would be more of the seed dispersers i mean i'm thankful to both of them like, right eternally thankful i couldn't i don't want to live in a world without chocolates so. <laughs> all right uh, during my pregnancy because i haven't been drinking like trying to avoid caffeine so i have mm-hmm. given up coffee I drink hot chocolate every single morning. Okay, so guys, it's been like, what am I at? Six and a half months? Yeah. Six and a half months of hot chocolate every single morning. Are you not tired of it? No, it's chocolate, <laughs> man. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I like chocolate, but I have a very particular yeah. chocolate taste. Like, I do not like most popular brand name chocolates. Like, I'll eat it, but I'm very partial to, we have an amazing, <clears throat> an amazing chocolate family-owned business in Pittsburgh, and it's called Saris Candies. Shout out to Saris. Amazing, Sponsor amazing. Us. We'll taste and review your chocolate. Or I yeah, will. yeah, right. <laughs> it is so good. Every year we get chocolate-covered pretzels for Christmas. The you know any excuse we have to buy. Anything of chocolate of theirs, we definitely do. Fantastic chocolate. Because mm. mm. I don't like I don't like most. Uh, cha- yeah, I just don't like most chain. All right, who's your next pollinator? Uh, so when most people think of pollinators or things other than pollinators, um, they da- they normally don't think of mammals, which was the first one I talked about. But they really. Don't think of marsupials, but shut the front door. If bats weren't cute enough, this one definitely takes the cake. So let me, let me hold on. I think what marsupial. Okay. I have a guess. Keep going. Found in far Southwestern Australia. Of course. We always are going back there. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Cannot avoid them. I'm going to be talking and introducing you to hopefully the honey possum. Oh, it's Tarsipes rostris. Okay, that was pretty good. Yeah, not half bad. All right, <laughs> not half bad pronunciation. Yeah. So weighing in between seven to ten grams. Oh wow, that's that's smaller uh, than I thought they were. Yep, they are. I thought they were bigger so, than that. So tiny. These tiny pouch wearers can drink up to seven milliliters of nectar a day. Okay. Now what I need is someone to convert this. Oh, like what is? I gotcha. Okay, good. So <laughs> to put it into comparison, that would be like if a human drank fifty liters of Pepsi or Coke a no. d- today. Oh my gosh! The little <laughs> things—they're just like shaking up in the sugar, tr- vibrating yeah. so fast. Yeah. Sugar addicts. Sleep. Yeah. So I, I just so between the vibrating and how their teeth haven't fallen out, I'm not, like I'm sure that it's like different sugar. Right. But it, yeah, it'd have to be, right? Right. But you know, still you know, a diabetes and <laughs> yeah, little little di- diabetes honey possums. Poor guys, huh? So the honey possum, so they're seven to ten grams. They are also uh sixty five to eighty five millimeters long with gray slash brown fur and three brown stripes down their back, which is pretty much how they're most recognizable is the three stripes down their back. Okay. 
Um, so fun, f- fun fact about their size, although they are incredibly small, males are generally even smaller than females. However, their testes make up 4.2% of their body weight. Whoa. In comparison, Whoa. if humans weighed the same, wow. <laughs> if a male weighed, let's just take a, a human male, and if he weighed 150 pounds, that means his dangling bits would weigh just shy of 6.5 pounds. Oh, that's <laughs> terrifying. So, for the honey possum, I'm not sure how they walk, um... Well, they, but, they probably just climb, right? Yeah, right. They don't really. <laughs> or anything. They still gotta walk, like, never mind. <laughs> so I was gonna say, yeah, splinters. Right. I have I was so many questions. The same thing. Yeah, why would you have testes that big when you're arboreal? Yeah, does not make sense. All right, Water, so. maybe. I don't know. <laughs> just floating there. I mean, that would make more sense than scraping along wood yes, all day. Yes, scraping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe they, got, maybe they got like a thick callus down there. <laughs> so gross. That's so gross. Okay, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know. I'm gonna finish this up. So they also have uh, a long snout, which makes sense because you know anything that has to get to the nectar at the bottom of a flower, it only makes sense. Um, their prehensile tail is disproportionately larger than their body. Um, with this tail and in them being so cl- so tiny, they climb through vegetation very easily to reach. Uh, really whatever little flowers their heart desires um because they're so tiny they're very agile climbers um and like we were saying earlier they're arboreal i mean why go down and be hunted especially when you're that tiny you know why go down to the ground and be killed when you're very adaptable for swimming or (laughs) swimming for climbing so might as well stay in the trees uh what i mean which is pretty neat considering how small they are um So, as I mentioned earlier, they are found in, like, far, far, far southwestern Australia. In the Banksia, Woodlands, Sandplain, Heathlands, and Shrublands, where they serve as totem animals for the Noongar people. Um, And we call them indigenous, but from what I was finding, it's like Australians, they kept using the word traditional owners of the region, um, which is my understanding that it's the same thing as what we would call our, our indigenous, yeah. um, which if you think you about see, it, do you go ahead. Your, uh, the other name for the honey possum is the Nulbanger? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. So well, cause cute. it's, it's the Noongar people. And so yeah. that would kind of, yeah, it kind of makes sense. But I didn't know that one, I didn't know that totems were found in other places outside of North America, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but also like that is such a small animal. I think it's, it has to be the tiniest totem animal out there. I just looked it up. It looks like a shrew. Right. It's so cute, but they're really cute. cute. It's really cute. And imagine that on a, look up the the name of that and then put totem after it And, and look at the, it's pretty cool. I, again, I had I didn't know that there were totems, because it's like a very Canadian North America thing. Yeah. I didn't know that they were found, and that's like like far southwestern Australia. I just didn't know that. All right, so pollination with honey possums. I already touched on their nectar addiction, um, but they are the only flightless animal that feeds exclusively on nectar and pollen. Fascinating. Like, yeah. Like many nectar-eating birds, they have bristles on the end of their tongue, which helps them to collect nectar deep in flowers. Uh, their tongue is 1.8 centimeters long, which means it makes up about a quarter of its, like a quarter Whoa. of the size of its head and, and yeah. body length. Um, so super long tongue, super long tail, tiny body. Like bats, the honey possum, they're also nocturnal pollinators. Also like bats, plants rely on them moving the pollen. When they go in for a drink, pollen gets on their fur. Then they travel to another flower carrying the pollen. Because remember, they're sugar addicts. They drink a crap ton of nectar every day. 
So they, they do get around from flower to flower. Now, unlike bats, though, honey possums do not pollinate any fruits or highly important fruits for humans. Um, they mostly just pollinate flowers that are just flowers. Yeah, they, yeah. You know, just flowers for the sake of being flowers. Um, they are, however, extremely important in pollinating banksia and eucalyptus flowers. So you might be thinking, woohoo, they help pollinate eucalyptus, so of course they help koalas. Well, if you remember from our koala section in the, uh, what was the episode, How Are You Still Alive? Yes. Koalas could not <laughs> live further from honey possums because they're on complete opposite <laughs> sides of the continent from koalas. Why? So koalas are from the eastern forest of Australia. Like I said, honey possums far southwestern side. So while honey possums may not be beneficial to humans as bat, uh, they are beneficial to the creatures that live in the area, helping the forest to grow and spread. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and what's also interesting, I did find a fact, but I only found it on, like, two websites um, that seemed pretty credible, but I couldn't really find it anywhere else. They also said something about they have, they only live in forests that are, like, because there's a lot of obviously natural burning going on in Australia um, that, that's healthy. Like a lot of ecosystems need that natural burn, but they will only live in forests that are older than like 24 to 26 or so years old. Hmm. And so they live in like older forests, run around, help pollinate everything. And if that one has a burn, they just like move on. Yeah, move on, which which is kind of interesting. Okay. Um. Well, actually. We're doing this perfectly, even though we don't know what each other have, because you were just talking about, you mentioned birds, and that's what mine is. Well, what, um, are the ch- <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned birds. Also, very similar pollination roles to the honey possum in that really birds don't pollinate things that humans need, mm-hmm. but they pollinate for the sake of forests and other animals. Okay. So, Birds. They, um, a th- one third of plant families, okay, so that's a hundred families of plants attract birds. Maybe not solely, but, I mean, that is a freaking, a third of base of all plants attract birds. <laughs> and the flowers that are visited by birds are typically really tubular and have, like, like, trumpet looking and have petals that are recurved to be out of the way. Um, they have strong supports for perching in places like Asia and Africa, while in the Americas, they don't have perching at all. Interesting. Um, Which makes sense for the birds themselves. So Asia and Africa is going to rely on things like parrots and, um, like, uh, honey creepers and things like that. In the Americas, we have hummingbirds and hummingbirds hover while they feed, so they don't need perching. Uh, the flowers have to be very sturdily constructed, and they're typically red, yellow, or orange. They don't need to have a sense of smell. They just have to be open during the day. But they have to have a lot of nectar in order to be able to attract these birds, because the birds need a lot. So they also, um, they produce a, a decent amount of pollen, but they're designed in a special way that when the bird goes in, the stamens, which are the part of the flower that have the pollen at the tips, yes. they usually come out of the flower so that they run into the bird's head or, like, <laughs> tap on the back of the bird's yeah. neck. <laughs> so it's like a little yeah. and yeah. Uh, <laughs> a little boop, and it gets some feathers on the bird. So some examples of flowers like this are hibiscus, orchids, cardinal flower, trumpet vine, red columbine, etc. So... 2,000 species of birds are known to pollinate, which I thought was pretty surprising. I didn't hmm. think it'd be so many. Yeah, no, I didn't either. Um, and, well, I guess it's not, yeah, yeah. 2,000 species of birds known to pollinate. Things like hummingbirds, honey creepers, brush-tongued parrots, etc. And 8,000 species of plants alone in the Americas rely specifically on hummingbirds. So that's what I'm going to talk about really quick is hummingbirds specifically because that's what we've got here in the U.S. Um, So, well, the continental U.S., I should say, because in Hawaii they have some other things. Um, So they feed on nectar for energy and they also feed on insects for protein, but those insects are usually found in flowers. They have long slender beaks and super long tongues 
And in particular, hummingbirds are attracted to red flowers. They can weigh anywhere from 2 to 24 grams, which is so tiny. <laughs> yeah, that is really tiny. Like I mean, I knew that they grams? were small. Yeah. yeah. 2 grams Goodness. is so small. Um, and they need to eat several times that weight in nectar per day to keep them alive. <laughs> because <laughs> so I don't know why they design uh, themselves like this. But right? They have insane high energy output. Such as their heart beats 1,200 times per minute, their wings beat 70 times per second, and when their tongue comes out, they lick 10 to 15 times per second. Jeez. <laughs> Which I wish, I wish we could see our audience as they're hearing that fact, because I really want to know how many people are trying it right now. That's what I was, I was just thinking. I was like, <laughs> 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 um, so they need all that nectar just to stay alive. If they have a bad day, that's it. They don't make yeah. the next one. Um, and in order to get enough food, they have to visit 1,000 to 3,000 flowers per day. <laughs> wow. It's kind of like bats with insects. Like yeah, it's, yes. If you don't get enough, it's just Gone. Yeah, you're just done. Some are super specialized, such as the South American sword-billed hummingbird, which has a four-inch beak, which is exactly the right say. length. For, for passion flowers. That's intense. A sword beak. Yeah. A sword or a sword build hummingbird. Sword. Sword. <laughs> Stay fast. Sword build hummingbird. Sword. Sword. I can't. Sword build hummingbird. <laughs> yeah. Four inch beak specifically for passion flowers. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's so specific. Goodness. So we, we need to expand our how are you still alive edition. Yeah. Because <laughs> we, we yeah. keep finding more. Because yeah, hummingbirds for sure are specialists. And like all things that are specialists, they're not really designed for change. Yeah, um, no. So they're not, you know, birds are not nearly as efficient pollinators in, as insects, but they do still do a great job. Um, they're not vital for crops, but are important for other flowering plants. And many exclusively rely on birds. And flowers and hummingbirds are tied so closely that it's thought that this caused rapid speciation, which means new species coming about. So, like, it's, it's the same with bats. They're, yeah. they're so incredibly um, specialized that they've caused plant <laughs> species to keep changing. Yep. Um, specifically, and like hummingbirds, like, you see that a lot with like bromeliads in the rainforest. There's a lot of speciation among those. So, birds. Great pollinators. Most people don't think of them until you're like, oh, yeah, the hummingbird. Yeah, yeah right. Um, but not nearly as efficient as our insect friends. Alrighty. I think that's it then. Yeah. So, hopefully you guys have some more appreciation for our poor underrepresented pollinators. I mean, not that bees and butterflies don't deserve the love, but there's lots more out there and many more we didn't talk about, like beetles and moths yeah. and lemurs and all sorts of things and and really yeah i feel like we talked we found some really cool ones to talk about so yeah a reminder next week we're gonna have a biologist um on as a guest and they're gonna be talking about more pollination uh, and what their job does which is focusing on pollinators uh, so make sure you tune in next week in the meantime if you want to s s go to our discord page we'll post the links we'll, we'll put it the in the bios of like our social media pages so make sure you that would probably be the easiest place to put it yeah, so yeah. go there for it join the nerd nation talk to us and others like you oh just about fun animal stuff yeah, um we're checking us out on patreon we're gonna put more and more yep. stuff up there yep so there's plenty of places to connect with us and and like laura mentioned patreon we want to keep bringing on more interviews uh and, and we want to keep bringing getting the show better and better so if you feel like you want to support us it would definitely help with the content and we can bring on bigger and better guests like and the one we're gonna have next week get, you'll all get perks too yep give a little get a little benefits everybody Mutualism. all right yeah right <laughs> throwing out our biology terms there <laughs> <laughs> all right all right all right check out nerd nation we will talk to you all hopefully there and if you don't know what discord is shoot us a message on social media and we can help you out and explain it to you, but it's really fun. So hopefully we will talk to you all on Nerd Nation before next week's episode. All right, see you next week, everybody. Bye.